In the middle of my first year of college, I signed up to eat in a co-op. Where I went to school, there was an extensive system of what they called co-ops, where students are responsible for making their own meals. Everything from sourcing the ingredients to planning daily breakfast and lunch and dinner and snacks for a group of around 75 students, to cleaning up afterwards and maintaining the state standards for a clean commercial kitchen. It's a bit cheaper to eat in a co-op than to eat in a regular cafeteria, and then that's made possible by all of our work to make it all happen. Each member of the co-op signed up for something like five hours of jobs a week, and somehow, through the collective effort and organization of the team, it all gets done. Initially, most of my work was what is known as kitchen prep, or KP. This meant I had to show up at some point in the afternoon in the kitchen and would find a handwritten note, sometimes it was just a little sticky note, of what was needed to be cleaned and peeled and chopped for that evening's dinner. Many of the vegetables were sourced from local farms, which meant that we ate with the seasons and knew some of the farmers who grew our food, but also that the food also needed a lot of cleaning sometimes. Anybody spent some time scrubbing uh, carrots and potatoes? <laughs> there were lots of knives, and almost all of them were wildly dull, and almost none of us knew what we were doing. Even those of us whose families had taught us to cook a bit growing up did not have the efficiency and the skill of the professional chefs who are rapidly able to prepare ingredients in bulk. And so I remember showing up at that kitchen for the first time, a nervous and lonely 18-year-old entering into a community of people who mostly already knew each other and being told that I had about two hours to do something like scrub 60 potatoes, peel and mince 30 heads of garlic, and chop 40 onions. <laughs> the student chef who was leading us wore contact lenses. And so some of you know where I'm going with this. He didn't think chopping 40 onions was like a big deal. Those of you who have not chopped onions before you've worn contact lenses may think it's no big deal to chop onions. Um, because there's this trick that if you wear contact lenses, it's no big deal to chop onions. I did not wear contact lenses at that time in my life. And so awkwardly chopping 40 onions with a dull knife as tears streamed down my face for several hours a week was the kind of hell on earth designed perfectly for an insecure 18-year-old who desperately wanted to look cool and make new friends. But I had signed up for it, and so there I was. Usually we would put on music, and I would work alongside usually another, uh, another student who was at that point a stranger to me to clean and peel and chop everything that was needed. And there would be a constant stream of other students going through the kitchen. Um, they would be on their way to grab a snack or take a shortcut up to their dorm room upstairs as we worked. And once we finished with all the meal prep, another team of students would come in and actually cook the food. And then another team would come in after them to clean up after the meal. From start to finish, it was probably a five-hour process, maybe involved seven or eight people. And though I knew some of the ingredients that would be part of the dinner, I often didn't know actually what was being made. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it wasn't. <laughs> often it wasn't. <laughs> but we all ate it either way, all 75 of us, wolfing down our vegetarian farm to table bowls that were often inadequately cooked beans and overcooked rice and poorly seasoned vegetables. And I'm realizing, <laughs> I'm realizing as I preach this now how ironic it was because we mostly listened to salt and pepper while we made our food that was incredibly lacking in salt and pepper. <laughs> Is that irony or am I doing like an Alanis Morissette thing? I'm looking at the English teachers. Okay, I'm looking at Kate who's an English teacher. <laughs> The whole process was so much less convenient than just going to a cafeteria at the school and grabbing a tray and eating one of the dozens of options that was available to the students there. Leaving the prep and cleanup to somebody else, eating whatever I wanted, not the one maybe not good thing that was put in front of me. 
But there is something satisfying about knowing your farmers and making your own healthy food and about working together with others to feed a crowd, right? Some of you know that joy, that satisfaction. There's something satisfying about learning a speedy way to peel 20 heads of garlic. I never did learn it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I tried really hard and it was satisfying. I actually have some better tools now than I did then. What I didn't realize until much later in life was that though my job was kitchen prep, the lasting work was building community. Some of my closest relationships to this day, something like 25 years later, were forged in that kitchen. I'm talking about the people who have stayed by my side when things didn't come easy in life. People who let the shoulders of their shirts become soaked with my tears after my father died in my early 20s. People whose arms carried my belongings up five flights of steps to my tiny one window studio when I left my first marriage in my late 20s. People whose gentle hands also carried up flowers from my coffee table that day and chocolate and wine and who made my bed for me so I would have a soft place to rest my head that first devastating night. These are people who danced their hearts out downstairs in Griffin Hall at my wedding reception when I found love again here at the church in my 30s. I didn't find love here in the church. I got married in the church. It's, I should say it's unethical for a minister to find love in a church, so I just want to make that <laughs> make it clear. I found love before. It's Kai. He's in the back. I love you, Kai. And then we got married here in the church, which is ethical. <laughs> In that kitchen, 25-ish years ago, I met my friend who would eventually become the sperm donor for our children. And I see his facial expressions on my two kids every day. In a very real sense, the inconvenience of cleaning and chopping and peeling endless potatoes and onions and bunches of kale led to some of the most precious gifts in my life. My network of lifelong friends, the smiles on my children's faces, the curls in their hair. Last week, I posted a request for fast and convenient dinner ideas to help my family eat more vegetables on social media. Some of you saw, some of you responded. Uh, within hours, I had received something like 72 comments on Facebook and like 11 comments on Instagram. Others of you texted me, just you texted me your recipes rapidly. They were all good ideas um, and good recipes and a lot of commiseration too from other people who are really busy. Everyone's ideas sound great, but they still sound hard to implement in the chaos of my life, even though these are people's best answers to how to make a convenient meal for dinner quickly. After my partner and I get off work every day and pick up the kids from daycare in the evening, we often need food to be ready almost instantly in order to keep our toddler from having a meltdown and for me to eat before my frequent Zoom meetings that I have as minister of this congregation. And I still think wistfully of those meals that we made in college. I love the idea of getting a farm share or even just stocking up on like whole vegetables more often and cooking healthy and delicious meals from real ingredients grown nearby. I know that there are some people who have figured out how to do that, how to build those kinds of meals in their lives when they have two small children or sort of whatever your equal level of chaos is. I have not figured out how to do it. And the flood of responses from my friends on social media and from many of you makes me think that a lot of other people have also not figured out how to make convenient meals. Lots of us are desperate for the answer for how to do it, how to do what I did in college, but do it in five minutes rather than five hours, right? And what we forget, or maybe what most of us remember but choose to ignore, is that even if we could accomplish that five-hour task in five minutes, the gift that would be lost would be the friendship and the connections and the relationships built in the inconvenience of making a meal from scratch. Convenience is an idol of the first world. It's probably especially adored by those of us here in the United States. 
In theory, there are tools and services and products that exist to make our lives more convenient, our lives more efficient, that allow us to get through things that we don't like a little bit faster, maybe, things that give us a little bit more choice for how we use our time. Convenience goes hand in hand with our capitalist economic system, which tells us that time is money and therefore that we want to save time the way we would like to save money, that we want to spend our time wisely the way we'd like to spend our money wisely. And so if we can cheaply buy a bag of pre-washed and pre-cut vegetables, or better yet, a meal that's pre-prepared and frozen, or even better, just like get takeout from a why on earth would we instead choose to buy dirty vegetables from a farmer that often needs several washings and hours of chopping and cooking? If we can go to a meeting on Zoom from our homes in our pajamas, no less, why on earth would we instead choose to put on uncomfortable clothing and commute to a physical place to join other people for the exact same meeting? Wouldn't we have more time and energy for leisure, for doing things that we love, if we just ate frozen meals and did all of our connection with people on Zoom? Like many side effects of the capitalist economic system, there's enormous drawbacks to our humanity and to our spirituality and to our earth when we prioritize convenience above all things. And I want to be clear that convenience Another important gift of convenience is what it makes possible for people of, of different mobilities and different, um, different levels of accessibility in this world. Um, convenience culture is actually, um, un, uh, what's the word, like it's sort of like a disability rights culture in some ways. There's enormous gifts to it for that reason. I don't want to diminish how powerful it has been um, to making life easier for all of us, but particularly making life possible for people who deal with certain disabilities. But there are enormous drawbacks. Like when we choose the most convenient option, we tend to find ourselves disconnected from the land. When I cook a frozen pizza, I give absolutely no thought to where its wheat or oregano were grown. I don't consider the cows that made the milk to make the cheese. I don't think about the working conditions of the people who harvested the tomatoes. It's a dramatically different experience than the one I have when I talk to the farmer at the farmer's market who I see every week about which peaches are going to be best this week and which berries are nearly done for the season and what to look forward to next week. Beyond our own disconnection from the land, we know that our land itself is devastated by us trying to make the world fit our human needs rather than making our lives fit into the place of Earth where we live. And when we work in jobs that primarily use our brains and outsource the physical labors of life to people and to machines, we know that our bodies often lose the rhythm of what it means to work, this rhythm that can help actually support both our physical and our mental health. When we work in jobs that only involve planning or only involve carrying out what other people have planned, it's easy to become judgmental of the other, right? Some of us work in jobs that only are on one side of that or the other. We think, what idiot would design things this way when we're putting together a flat pack piece of furniture? And then we think, what idiot would do things this way, we say, as we're <laughs> disappointed in the crew working on the road outside our homes. What I believe is that spiritual deepening never arrives in the middle of multitasking. It's reserved for mindful time, for time when we give our full attention or time we intentionally leave as empty in our lives. And one of the greatest losses in our devotion to convenience is the loss of the creative beauty that comes from letting the larger work, world work on us letting the larger world work on us. I'm talking about the discomfort of showing up in a new place and encountering a stranger. Some of us, maybe, maybe the most optimistic and extroverted among us, find those encounters with strangers nourishing most of the time. But I think that most of us have some kind of trepidation when we encounter uh, new people, when we go somewhere where we know we're gonna be forced to be at least a little bit uncomfortable. 
What if we don't like the new people that we meet? What if they don't like us? What if we're trapped in a conversation we don't want to be in but don't know how to leave? What if we go to a new community, like a new congregation, and we don't like what they say? We believe that time is money, and we would rather spend our time wisely with the people we know we already like, with the settings that we know we will already be comfortable. But what we know is that growth as a human doesn't really come about in our zones of comfort. I don't think growth primarily comes from the people we know and like the most, even. I think growth as an emotional and spiritual being comes most from encountering the unknown, meeting a new person, maybe even particularly one we're not sure we're gonna like. It forces us to gain a stronger sense of self. It forces us to define ourselves and our boundaries in relationship to the other person, all which is difficult but important personal work. Or maybe a new person forces us to access our compassion in a way that makes us kinder, that puts us in closer touch with that which is softest and best within us. Some Buddhist teachers call the most difficult people in our lives our gurus. In other words, the people who push all of our buttons are our greatest spiritual teachers because it's when our buttons are pushed, when we're irritated and activated, that we have a chance to work with those difficult parts of ourselves, to understand those difficult parts, to understand our buttons, to offer them grace, to find a deeper human truth within us. When capitalism tells us that time is money and we better spend our time wisely, we can also forget that it's not all about us. Sometimes when we learn from an uncomfortable experience or from an encounter with a stranger, is that our job isn't the one to receive the gift, but our job is to be the one who offers, and someone else is the one who gets. The person who offers welcome to a person who is seeking belonging. And in the act of giving that most precious gift of connection to another, to the newcomer, to the stranger, to the long time lonely one, we find that life is made far more rich by what we give than what we receive. It's not lost on me that this weekend marks the four year anniversary of the pandemic lockdown, at least here in Philadelphia. <laughs> The pandemic has been such a time of intense universal loneliness in, for so many of us in so many different ways. I know that some of us have lost loved ones to COVID and have found that the lockdown is a time of the most painful grief and deepest loneliness of our lives. I know that some of us were cut off from our loved ones and communities and were isolated in our homes in ones or twos or threes. Some of us were cut off from our support systems, particularly parents who had children schooling and home with no help while trying to simultaneously work full-time jobs with no childcare, no babysitters, no grandparents, no school. And others of us were cut off from rest and leisure in the chaos of working extended shifts in medical jobs. People who slept in different rooms from their partners for months to avoid possibly infecting them. People who worked themselves nearly to death as they tried to keep others alive. So much loneliness, no matter which situation was ours. And though the pandemic has helped most of us discover new conveniences, Zoom meetings as a new way to hold meetings and worship, other technical tools that make collaboration more easy, that help make justice work more easy, a massive expansion of home delivery services, in that time we lost that chance encounter with the stranger who might have become our spiritual guru as they irritated us and also taught us patience and compassion. During that time, we lost the gift of being able to soak a friend's shirt with our tears when our loved ones died. 
During that time, we lost the gift of a friend's strong arms who could carry our belongings up five flights of stairs when it came time to make an impossible choice to start over. We even lost the gift of friends who could dance with us in our greatest moments of joy during that time. Students lost the friendships that were forged in the scrubbing of potatoes and in the peeling of garlic and in the abject misery of chopping dozens and dozens of onions. We lost so many of those creative possibilities that arise when we let the world work on us. The conversations with strangers on the bus, the hallway conversations with our coworkers, the chance encounter that might have changed everything for the future of our lives. What I realized as I wrote this sermon is that no one wrote on my social media uh, in, in response to my request for convenient meal ideas. But what's probably actually the right answer is that we should have meal prep parties. We should have several households who join together and some people play with the children and some people plan the meals and do the shopping. And some people clean. And some of us chop the vegetables and some of us cook them and some people clean up afterwards. And we all take home cheap and delicious and healthy dinners for the week that might have been grown closer to where we live as we grow closer to each other. And it would be fun too. If anyone wants to start a meal prep ministry, just talk to, talk to me after the service. <laughs> Maybe it's the answer for all of us. Victoria Safford writes, whose are you? When you walk out of your room, out of your home, into the sunlight of the day, to whom in this wild world do you belong? When it's been a hard day's night, we know that it's not convenience that makes us feel all right. It is each other. When we break down, it's not Amazon and Zoom that come out to find us. When we forget love, it's not Google documents and frozen dinners that remind us. <coughs> I am increasingly coming to believe that all that matters in life is born in inconvenience. That which stays by us when life doesn't come easy is born in these uncomfortable moments when our time is not being spent wisely. And instead, we just simply let the larger world work on us. My friends, may you find the gift of inconvenience this week. Amen and blessed be. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. And I'm Reverend Abby Tennis. We are the ministers at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where our mission is to awaken love and justice in our lives and in the world. We're so grateful that you watched, and we hope that the sermon connected with your soul. We also want to invite you to join us for a live worship service every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can always find the link to that service on our website at www.philauu.org. In these services, you'll hear words like you've just heard, and you also get a chance to greet one another, pray together, sing together, and we even hold a virtual coffee hour after services to get a chance to greet some new and old friends. If you want to support the mission of this community and you feel moved to give, you can do so by going to the website that Reverend Abby just mentioned. You can find that link below, or you can text 215-709 5095 and follow the prompts to give. If someone in your life needs to hear these words today, we encourage you to share this video. And again, thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you soon.